They say that a hero is only as good as his or her villains, and today we're going to celebrate the awesomeness of pop culture heroes by focusing in on those very villains. The Nerd by Word starts now. Ladies and gentle nerds, welcome back to another episode of the Nerd By Word podcast, the best nerd podcast around. Although there are plenty of really good ones, we're the best. It's undeniable. I'm here with my buddy Chris, and we are ready to dive into a big topic, some of our favorite pop culture villains. Before we do, though, it's time for... Chris, what is new? Well, Scarlett Johansson is making a very noisy exit for herself uh, from the MCU. According to a report from the Wall Street Journal, the Black Widow star has filed a $50 million breach of contract lawsuit against Disney in Los Angeles Superior Court. The suit alleges that the company violated an agreement by releasing the film simultaneously on their streaming platform, Disney+. Plus as she alleges a significant portion of her salary would be derived from the box office performance. Marvel Studios president Kevin Feige is also reportedly, quote, angry and embarrassed, end quote, at how Disney has handled and is handling the situation. Disney returned fire, stating that Johansson was displaying a, quote, callous disregard, end quote, of the impact of the worldwide COVID-19 pandemic, Now, there are several factors worth keeping in mind here. First and foremost, Scarlett Johansson was the highest grossing actress in Hollywood in 2018 and 19 before the coronavirus completely crippled the traditional box office as we know it. Secondly, Disney Disney and Marvel Studios maintained for well over a year that despite COVID caused delays, Black Widow would remain an exclusively theatrical release. It was only a few months ago that a hybrid release was announced. It remains to be seen as to whether this decision uh, included a contractual renegotiation with Johansson, and whether or not that was even attempted. Now many celebrities are following in her footsteps. Actor Gerard Butler is filing a $10 million suit against the producers of Olympus Has Fallen. Apparently, they're still making those movies. And actress Emma Stone is, quote, considering her options, end quote, regarding a similar Disney release for her film, Cruella. Not all stars are feeling the same, however. Dwayne The Rock Johnson and his Seven Bucks Productions, quote, have no intention of battling Disney for any anticipated loss of dollars, end quote, as Jungle Cruise is currently experiencing the same release uh, this week. The ripple effect that is sure to follow, even after the dust settles, will be fascinating to watch develop. My intuition tells me that we are uh, in the midst of a changing of the tides when it comes to cinematic entertainment. Admittedly, personally, I've never been a big fan of going to the theater, at least not since becoming a parent. College is a different story. It is much more fiscally responsible for me to purchase a $30 Premier Access rental on Disney+. Plus that the whole family can enjoy rather than forking over nearly $10 per person plus snacks. Add to that the innovations of streaming and home entertainment systems, and it would appear that we're staring down the barrel of our own Nexus event. Dave, you're very much of a different opinion with regards to your cinematic endeavors. What say you? Um, So this is going to be a spicy take, I think, but uh, here goes nothing. Screw Disney. Uh, I've seen a lot of anti-Scarlett Johansson rhetoric on social media because of this lawsuit. I mean, she already made $20 million. She's greedy. She doesn't care about the COVID pandemic. And really, honestly, it's all a little much. I think it's important to remember that Disney has a tendency of trying to take a dump on its creative talent. That's just a history that's there, period. A few examples. 
Recently, as we have talked about several episodes back, Disney stopped paying royalties to Star Wars authors, including famously Alan Dean Foster, who has made a really big a bit of noise about that. Uh, this also may include uh, writer Jonathan Rinsler, who wrote several Star Wars making of books under Lucasfilm before the Disney purchase, and who now needs to have a GoFundMe to raise money for his cancer treatment. Ed Brubaker recently revealed that he gets more money for his work as an extra in Captain America the Winter Soldier than he does for actually creating the concept of the Winter Soldier. In short, Disney likes to screw talent, and if ScarJo's statement is true that she was a contractually guaranteed an exclusive theatrical theatrical release and B was supposed to receive a percentage of the box office as a sort of bonus then yeah I mean I can understand why she's shif- uh, suing Disney basically shifted at least part of the revenue stream to Disney plus and if they did not renegotiate with her that means that that revenue stream went directly into their pocket and that is pretty darn underhanded You know, the fact that Disney then called her callous toward the COVID pandemic was a pretty low blow. I mean, she's a businesswoman, after all, who is insisting a contract should be honored that both parties signed. And if Disney wanted to release the movie on Disney Plus as well, then they should have renegotiated. Why not share those profits as well to honor the spirit of the original contract? And if you ask me, Disney has additional egg on its face in my book, considering they are uh, hiding behind COVID when it comes to this lawsuit, yet they're advertising Shang-Chi as only in theaters. Could it be that Shang-Chi star Simu Liu doesn't get a share of the profits, so Disney feels no need for a dual release of that movie? The whole thing seems extremely shady from the extremely shady corporation. Yeah, I, I, I don't want to come across as caping for a big corporation. Um I'm I'm very much of the opposite inclination. Um to be to be to to put all my cards on the table, this feels like two heel wrestlers going back and forth. I'm I'm admittedly not a huge fan of Scarlett Johansson. Uh I think she has taken some regrettable stances, you know, with regards to um race relations, with regards to defending um serial uh violators uh in the wake of the me too movement um and seeing her go up against big bad disney it's like i hope kind of hope that they both lose so um i am much more inclined to to take offense when it comes to someone like you know alan dean foster or someone like uh um al milgram and stuff like that so this is just a, a crazy, crazy situation, and um, it's going to be wild to see it shake out. You know, ultimately, I have no problem with things being shifted to streaming releases as long as the talent involved gets, uh, you know, compensated the way they would have, uh, you know, if it would have been released in theaters only. I think it's important that uh, corporations like Disney are ultimately held accountable uh, for the agreements that they sign and for the, you know, the talent that they ultimately, uh, for some reason, continue to screw over. Now, whether that is for a few thousand dollars or a few million makes very li- little difference to me ultimately, because A, I'm not involved in that and I'm not standing to get a 20 million or 50 million dollar paycheck one way or another from Disney. But the principle of the matter matters to me uh, very much. Creatives, need to be compensated and uh you know corporations like this need to be held accountable for the agreements that they make yeah for sure um dave what is up on the news desk for you this week oh i'm just depressed so you know let's talk horizon zero dawn for a second which was a surprise hit and shockingly good for a new property when it was first released on ps4 naturally a ps5 sequel was quickly announced the game was originally scheduled to release this year but a new report casts doubt on whether we'll see the game this year at all. Jason Schreier of Bloomberg, formerly Kotaku, reports that Sony has delayed the game to 2022, according to an inside source. According to Schreier's report on Bloomberg, and I quote here, The setback is the latest in a year that has been full of delays across the industry, including one of Sony's other big PlayStation exclusives, the untitled sequel to 2018's God of War. COVID-19 has caused production challenges, forcing developers to work from home for months. But the pandemic has also provided a cover for developers to bump games that were facing obstacles regardless. Other games that have been delayed 
uh, include Returnal, Hogwarts Legacy, a remake of Prince of Persia, The Sands of Time, and Lord of the Rings Gollum. And of course, previously, uh, Halo Infinite was very famously uh, delayed as well. So on the one hand, you know, I prefer when developers delay games to take the time to polish them rather than releasing a half-finished turd. On the other hand, I love the Horizon franchise and would love to play the sequel this year. On the third hand, because apparently I have three hands now, <laughs> it's almost impossible to find a PlayStation 5 anyway due to the chip shortages also brought on by COVID-19. So, meh. Thoughts, Chris? Um, go for another hand. You've got Prince... You, you be Prince Goro. Um, <laughs> fourth, fourth hand, screw the scalpers that are gobbling up all these units. You're not um, kidding. <laughs> yeah, so... You know, it's been very well documented that I am exclusively uh, a Microsoft and Nintendo gamer. Um, Sony, you know, has not gotten my business for quite some time. And, you know, they've priced me out for a good portion of the last decade plus. But, um, I mean, the the immediate thing that it brings to mind is, you know, exactly what you do said. If you're going to have delays, make the most of it. And, um, you know, is even 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 more so than make sure the game is functional. We don't have the bugs and all of that. But even even more than that for me is, you know, the horrendous working conditions that we've you know reported in the past when it comes to these video game developers where they're working something ridiculous like 70 hour work weeks and, and stuff like that. So if you're delaying this, you better, you know, it, you know, in the spirit of our previous news story, you, the, the people who are doing the work better be rewarded and taken care of. Absolutely. I can wholeheartedly agree with that. You know, video game crunch and development is probably one of the biggest problems in the industry right now. So, you know, take care of your talent guys. You know, and we've kind of sidestepped this news story for one reason or another, but like all the developments that are, are coming to light of, you know, companies like Activision Blizzard and one of my favorite studios, Ubisoft, of, of all of these horrendous, you know, accusations and allegations and, and reports of, you know, frat boy culture. I mean, I think I think it's time for a good purge in the video gaming industry, man. Yeah, something needs to happen. All right, well, that is it for Nerd News this week. After a quick break, we'll be back with a discussion of some of our favorite pop culture villains. Stick around. Welcome back, ladies and gentle people. It is time for our big segment, the very famous Incomparable. Yes, it's time for the Byword Big Talk. And this week, we are tackling discussion of some of our all-time favorite villains. Chris, we really didn't have any rules. They didn't have to be comic book villains or movie villains or TV villains, just villains in general in pop culture. Who is the first on your list of all-time favorite villains? Well, and, and, and this idea for this episode really popped into my head because I was listening back to previous episodes and it seems like, you know, you and I usually, even though we have our differences when it comes to DC and Marvel and whatnot, it, it can be kind of an echo chamber. We usually go to bat for the heroes and we, we don't pay too much attention to the villains. So think of this as our bad boys episode. Um, but you know, and I say all that, and my first entry isn't so much a villain anymore, at least in the last decade or so of publication. But um, I think for myself, the best villains or the best adversaries or whatever nomenclature you want to attribute to them are the ones that you can identify with and you almost go along with, or maybe you even do go along with them. I've never been one to you know, go against the grain. I've, I've always been a goody two shoes, but the one villain that I have always sided with is Magneto. I have always been fascinated by his character. Um, I know like the cliche thing is to say that he was, um, you know, likened after Malcolm X, but if you read the sixties comics written by Stan, drawn by Jack Kirby, um, <laughs> You don't really get that nuance. It, you get a real mustache twirly type villain. The nuance really comes with the Claremont era 
um, particularly in, in, in an entry that we visited on the podcast before. Um, and that's God loves man kills. That's, that was really the turning point for me where, where Magneto became one of the most fascinating characters in all of comic books, no matter, you know, what side of the line you, you go across, you know, you, you go to, uh, he's just always been fascinating to me. Um, but full disclosure, and, and you know, after something like um, you know the Stanley story um, that we that we talked about with um, author Abraham Reisman, you know, how much of what Stanley posited was truth, how much of it was fiction, how much of it was just a tall tale telling, it's hard to tell with Stan. But um, so maybe that was some revisionist history on his part, you know, likening the character to Malcolm X. But there are certain parallels and, you know, full disclosure, Malcolm X is is a historical figure that has always fascinated me, even from a young age, you know, in an admittedly watered down, diluted version of Martin Luther King that, you know, I received in elementary and middle school. The character was was great. And I was I was happy what it represented, for, uh, what, what it represented for civil rights. But for me, the far more fascinating character was Malcolm X and how it was a much more radical and much more, at least in my mind, what I was able to discover doing my own research, even at 13, 14 years old, was a much more fascinating character to watch and and to read about, um, you know, in seventh grade, we got to do two different biographies. And I read the autobiography of Malcolm X by Alex Haley uh, th- that was written with Alex Haley. And um, it was just fascinating to me that I had been spoon fed all of this stuff from primarily white teachers about this is what the civil rights movement was. And then just seeing this different perspective really was eye opening to me. And it was a real paradigm shift. Um, you know, and similarly, I, I can see those parallels with Magneto, whether it's cliche or not, um, whether his methods throughout the years have been, you know, completely defendable or not is up for debate. Um, but there, the, the one constant thing that he has always wanted is equal rights for mutants, you know, and, you know, the mutant metaphor has you know, persisted throughout the decades of, you know, representing minorities like uh, black Americans or queer Americans, you know, what have you. Um, So I've always identified with that character and I've always found it fascinating. And admittedly in the last decade or so, like I said, it's not been adversarial, but even before that time, one of my favorite characters in all of comics has been Magneto. You know, I always liked Magneto. I mean, you know, some of the best villains, as you said, are those who really have a point and those that you could almost agree with. And Magneto certainly falls under that category. His background as a Holocaust survivor, which I know came a little later, I think, is especially fascinating and a really good addition to his history. It explains a lot, I think, about how he deals with the notion of being, you know, a mutant, being different. Um, It doesn't hurt that we've had uh, really two very, very good actors portraying Magneto on the big st- big screen as well. I mean, whether the X-Men movies were always, you know, particularly good is definitely up for debate. Um, however, I think Magneto has always been a pretty consistent highlight in any, you know, major motion picture featuring him. And I think that that's probably something that has really helped his popularity as well. You know, I'm not nearly as big of an X-Men fan as you are, Chris, really who is but i definitely see <laughs> i definitely see the appeal of magneto as a character yeah that definitely and that that's a great point i appreciate you bringing that, that to the table is you can't go wrong with Suri and mckellen as as regrettable as so many of those movies are you know sir ian mckellen is just an inspirational figure for me as someone who has, you know, in his own right, you know, in real life, stood up for your equal rights for, for fellow LG, fellow members of the LGBTQ community, you know, from day one, like he's been doing, you know, this, you know, activism for for decades, and it's it's such an inspirational, you know, individual to be behind the, um, you know, behind the helmet and the cape. But then, you know, you trade that in for Michael Fassbender and he 
I mean, I'm telling you, some of those later entries, it feels like he was the only one that came to work those days. He was carrying those films. Um, my, I think my favorite scene in all of the Fox X-Men films, um, and, and th- that's not saying a whole lot because most of those I could just, you know, burn at the stake. But um, my, I think my favorite scene of, of all the X-Men films is um, when he hunts down the Nazis in Argentina in the bar. I, I just absolutely love that part. Um, and Fassbender just really brings it Um also, you know, it's great. He is hearing German on the screen. Would you agree? <laughs> yeah, but does it always have to be Nazis, Chris? <laughs> but it's time. consistent. It's, it's consistent with his character. This time, I'll take an exception. I, I, right. I agree with that. All right, Dave. So I know. Okay, so <laughs> you're bear with me here. You're the expert on DC. My only exposure to this character came from. Um, you know, the Injustice video games and that star studded Oscar winning film, uh, Green Lantern. Please don't make me hurl, Chris. It's not fair. <laughs> I really, I really don't want to mess up my equipment over here. Yeah. Let's talk about Thal Sinestro for a second. Uh, Sinestro, you know, of the Green Lantern comics is such a fantastic villain. He was considered the greatest member of the Green Lantern Corps. His sector of the universe was almost completely crime-free. He carried the respect of his peers and superiors. And it turns out, achieving this you know, near-perfect space sector took some really unfortunate methods. And Sinestro was actually more of a, a ruler, a dictator, who ruled his sector with an iron fist. He wasn't really doing the protect and serve space cop thing. He was really a space dictator whose power came not from willpower, as a Green Lantern should, but from fear. The people feared him. And on his home planet, uh, Korugar, he tried to basically stamp out free will. And the citizens rise up against him. And finally, the guardians of the universe who run the Green Lantern Corps are on to him. And uh, he's put on trial. And thanks in part uh, to the testimony testimony from Hal Jordan, he's, you know, banished. Uh, Then he gets a hold of a yellow power ring, one that's powered by fear, which makes perfect sense for his character. And he becomes basically the Green Lantern Corps' greatest villain. Um, Eventually, he even got a hold of more yellow rings and started his own core, which he, you know, arrogantly called the Sinestro Corps. This dude is so, so fascinating in the comics. He's, He's arrogant. He believes, you know, he's the very best. But on top of that, he may very well be the very best uh, that the Green Lantern Corps ever produced. Uh, and so that, that arrogance is in a small part, at least, justified. And it's not uncommon in, in several stories for Green Lanterns to actually have to seek this guy out and ask for his help, begrudgingly as it is. So he's just a fantastic villain, with, which with, has a really, really complex relationship with you know the main Green Lantern in the comics, Hal Jordan. Um, one of the best at DC. There was a really fantastic, fantastic animated movie a few years ago um, that basically was like Training Day, you know, but with Green Lanterns. And you have you know rookie Hal Jordan is being like, you know, inducted into the Green Lantern Corps by Sinestro, and he's supposed to be learning from Sinestro. And Hal Jordan keeps seeing all these things that you know Sinestro is doing that he's not supposed to do, and he has that moment where he has to stand up against him and stand for, you know, what's right and how how this power should be, you know, wielded. And it's just, it's a fantastic little animated film that I don't think gets enough credit because it really captures Sinestro perfectly. That, that, that swagger and that arrogance, but also that skill and that ability. So it's a great villain, probably one of the best DC has, Chris. Uh, is there a line in said film that has uh, Gorilla Grodd ain't got nothing on me? I wish It'd be awesome. <laughs> it really would be awesome, but no, I don't not that's all right. Yeah. So like those are some magic words for me. I know we throw that terminology around a lot on this podcast, but training day is one of you know I'll speak about acting performances of all time here, you know, in a moment, but it's it's up there as far as like all time acting performances. But um I really all jokes aside, Mark Strong's performance was one of the few kind of hidden gems um, of, of that film. So I was, I was wanting to see more, you know, with that that um, that initial 
you know, tease at the end where he turns sinister or what have you. But um, so this has always been a character that fascinates me. It's just like this when the curtain falls and, and what you thought was good and what you thought was true and righteous, uh, you know, ends up being something completely different. That's always been a fascinating storyline to watch develop across, you know, lots of different forms of media. Yeah, absolutely. And I think uh, Sinestro is just a great example of that. There are so many good stories featuring Sinestro. I'm just a, a big fan anytime he pops up in a, in a Green Lantern comic, uh, Chris. All right, Chris, what is your second favorite pop culture villain? So I'm, I'm going completely, and you you nailed it saying pop culture, because I'm not, it's, I don't know that this is necessarily nerdy, but it is very much pop culture. Um, and that would be Michael Corleone. Uh, the Godfather and the Godfather part two, in my opinion, I go back and forth, which one I like more, but I think the two of them stand alone as some of the finest cinematic productions that, that Hollywood has ever produced. Um, you know, and I, I hinted at it before, but I think Al Pacino and, and so many of, of the people on that cast turn in the greatest acting performances that I've ever seen on screen. Um, and it's just fascinating to watch like this good boy gone bad, you know, if you will, uh, just this de-evolution from a war hero who's in spite of his family's history, managed to keep his nose clean. He comes home and in, in the interest of preserving his family and the legacy and the history of his family and his heritage, you know, and just just falling into and and giving credence to all of these human vices and, you know, turning to the dark side, if you will. It's just fascinating to watch over this these two films. The third one's OK. I know it gets a lot of flack. It's all right. But the first two in particular that I'm I'm focusing on. But Michael is one of the most complex characters that I've ever watched um on screen or e even if you include literature in there uh it, it is just incredible and it's also you know as a history nerd it's an interesting kind of micro study of what it means to be an immigrant in america and like the historical aspects of being an italian american in in the mid 20th century uh is just fascinating and and, you know, you in the second film, you have, you know, the Cuban revolution and, you know, Castro coming to power with the revolutionaries and, you know, him having to flee. It's just fascinating to watch develop. And um, you you go from, you know, and Michael Corleone being this, like I said, this this Dudley do right type character returning home and like even his father, the god, the original godfather not wanting him to be a part of this endeavor, like letting the other members of the family take over. But, you know, for one reason or another, Michael is, has to resort to this and, and just this complete devolvement into even, even in my mind out, out kicking the coverage of what his father had done, you know, and, and this great operation that he has in New York, Michael expands the operations into uh, Nevada, into Florida, into Cuba. So it's just really one of the most fascinating things into where, at, at what cost? I think of that moment with, um, you know, in Infinity War with, with Thanos and uh, a young Gamora. It's like, at what cost? And it cost him everything. It cost him his family. It cost him his marriage. It cost him his children being taken away from him. Uh, it cost him his brother, you know, with the whole Fredo situation. So Michael Corleone is one of the most fascinating characters that I've ever been introduced to. And I just finished another rewatch of part one and part two of The Godfather. And it is I always find something new. And it's one of those, you know, those situations where you're like, it's a three hour movie. Like, how can you? And it's it goes by so quickly. But. I always learn something new. I always pick up new details and I've been watching it for years and it never gets old. How Michael is such a tragic character. You know, he was trying to get out, but he had to return to this life. He didn't want to take care of his family and then just gets in deeper and deeper. You know, tragic villains are almost as awesome as tragic heroes. I'm thinking, you know, like 
like Mr. Freeze from the Batman rogues gallery who just wants to save his wife. Those sorts of villains have, uh, you know, the sympathy uh, of the, the viewer, of the reader, but at the same time, um, you know, they take actions that are somehow repulsive. That's There's a real, you know, conflicted nature to those kinds of villains that I find absolutely fascinating. You know, you can sympathize with their plight, but you can't sympathize with their actions. Yeah, Mike was a great example of that. It's been a few years since I actually sat down and watched the Godfather movies, uh, although my father swears by them and watches, watches them at least once a year. So, <laughs> Well, I found that they were streaming on Peacock, so I was very, very happy to see that. It makes me very curious about uh, The Godfather Part 3, which just recently, I think, like got a recut version or something by the yeah. director. They even like changed the name on Peacock. It's not even called The Godfather Part 3. It's like The Fall of Michael Corleone or something like that. Yeah, I'm interested. Have you have you watched that version yet? No, not yet. I I'm going to I'm going to take a look at it. I think that's the version that's on Peacock. I just finished Part 2 um this morning, but I'm going to definitely look at at Part 3. All right, Dave. So, um I I recently commented that my only exposure to this character was through the advent of memes. So, I'm I'm interested to get uh to go to school, if you will, on this character. Yeah, you know, with uh Masters of the Universe being sort of back on everybody's radar, you know, thanks to the new show on Netflix, it's I think time that we pay homage to its best villain by far, and that's of course Skeletor. I mean, Mark freaking Hamill is voicing the guy right now. Does it get better than that? I think not. Skeletor is, of course, the lord of destruction and the primary villain that He-Man has to fight. His goal is to harness the power of Grayskull, the power that gives He-Man his power, so Skeletor can rule the universe. You know, Skeletor is awesome for a whole number of reasons. First of all, awesome design. You know, the purple bluish skin, the skull face, the ram staff. I mean, it's freaking perfect. Way to lean into, you know, a really cool visual. On top of that, he's a powerful sorcerer. He commands an army of bizarre yet interesting henchmen. And although today we look back on the original He-Man cartoon and think Skeletor is, you know, kind of a buffoon, it, I think it pays to remember that He-Man always took Skeletor extremely seriously. The guy was a threat. In fact, if you look back at those early cartoons, it was often the incompetence of his henchmen that caused Skeletor's plans to fail, not his own inability or uh, his own like non-threatening status. I also really like that some versions uh, postulate that Skeletor is really Keldor, the half-brother of King Randor and the rightful ruler, somebody who was rejected because he was you know, half-human and half a different race, which is why he has that purplish-blue skin, and he was rejected for being other, and the younger brother then became king, and that's, of course, He-Man's dad. So Skeletor, in some versions, is literally He-Man's uncle, although He-Man doesn't know that. And, you know, that that whole, like being rejected and and uh, kind of going a little mad about that and then coming back to try to reclaim your rightful place. that That's absolutely fascinating. There's a tragic dimension to the character that I think uh, goes kind of unmentioned oftentimes. I mean, sure, Skeletor is the villain who launched a thousand memes, but when you take a closer look, he's simply one of the best villains in pop culture, Chris. And, that, and that's a testament to the staying power of the character too, that even... Even before these new series were announced, like it was, you know, it's it, it was a regular thing, even by people who had no idea who Skeletor was. So that's that's a testament to it. And I'm I'm really interested in, in diving into the both of these new series or possibly even revisiting the uh, the original one and, and getting some you know, getting some further education, but I'm definitely, definitely intrigued. I mean, you say Mark Hamill and I'm there. All right, Chris, that brings us then to your third and final favorite villain of the episode. Who have you got? All right. So, uh, this, this, this is like, um, you know, when you, when you pick your final four bracket in March and you pick like the favored ones, this is, this is an easy pick for me. Uh, I'm going with shredder. Like there's something to be said about like that, that indomitable villain that is just always there and there's not a whole lot of nuance to the character and like they are just 
a villain. They're a bad guy. They're like this tower of darkness that you are always trying to conquer and trying to defeat every single time. Um, but Shredder, you know, from Shredder is also one of the first villains that I ever remember rooting against, um, you know, even from a young age. Um, whether that was on the uh, 87 animated series or whether that was on like, uh, you know, the video games for the Super Nintendo. Uh, I always remember that like Shredder was always the one that you keep coming back to the original, um, you know, films, the first and the second one. It's always it always it always somehow leads back to Shredder. Um, and and even now in the IDW series, it looks like they're they're bringing Shredder back from the dead. He's returned from hell. I think there was a micro series about um, you know Shredder in hell. Like there's he's he's such an iconic character that you just can't stay away from him. He's like he's like the turtles Joker. He's uh, the turtles you know what have you. Like it, he always just keeps coming back and. Just also for me, just like the 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 mystique factor, the cool factor of the Japanese influence of the character, the the Rokusaki aspect of it all, the whole ninja vibe, the whole Foot Clan endeavor. You talk about henchmen, you know, uh, you know, Foot Clan soldiers, you know, whether they're robots or they're actual humanoid human ninjas. Um, it's always been like this endless supply of of baddies at at the control of shredder so even in the campier parts you know voiced by the legendary uh james avery into what i'm thoroughly enjoying in the current idw series of you know the real you know honor bound what he what his ideology is when it comes to leading the foot clan and how that's in contrast to Hamato Yoshi or or Splinter. So I've always been a big fan of Shredder, even if it is there's no nuance to it. He's always the bad guy. It's always identifiable, and we we all points to lead to Shredder. And and even if I don't, you know, side with him ever, there's there's something to be said about the value of a character that 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 influential. You know, I feel like there's been a lot of tweaked versions of the Shredder over the years. And I have to admit, although I adore the original TMNT cartoon of yesteryear, my favorite versions of Shredder are probably A, the first live action TMNT movie, and the uh, incarnation from the IDW comic series. I think the, the first live action TMNT movie, that Shredder was so menacing and intimidating, particularly visually. And then he basically just wiped the floor with all the turtles yes. in, that, in that final fight. And it was just such a well-established threat in that movie. He was spot on. And then the IDW version is just much more, there's a lot more depth and complexity there. It's a kind of a fusion of some of the best things of the previous versions of Shredder, I think like much in the IDW series, really, it kind of takes the best elements from different interpretations and creates something unique and compelling. So yeah, you know, I love me some Shredder, but, but particularly those two versions are, are always really memorable to me. I wholeheartedly agree with all of that. And particularly in the, the first film, I also, I enjoy the campiness and the goofiness that is Secrets of the Ooze. I know that I, I I can be of the minority. A lot of people crap on the second film, but I adore it. It is one of my guilty pleasures. I I put it on screen all the time. But the first one, that that final fight, and and throughout, like there's something about that actor's eyes that that's the only body part that you can see. And it is so menacing and it, it is such a threat that that it is just iconic. And, and you know, like I, I will I will crow from the mountaintop about the current IDW series until the cows come home. I absolutely adore it. I think it is absolutely flawless, you know, no matter what directions they go in. And they particularly nailed it. I need to get caught up. I'm like four or five issues behind, but it's so, 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 so good. Oh, I'm a little further behind than you, but I'm a big fan as well and looking forward to getting caught up all the way. Okay, Dave. So we have talked about how many of our villains have been, I don't know, if nuanced or some that you can identify with. 
Your last villain is one that, at least for me, is universally just abhorred. Yeah, and sometimes you need that in a villain. But you know, I also... <sighs> There's so many male villains in pop culture, and I really wanted to talk about at least one female villain today. But, you know, it's 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 interesting how many of the really memorable female villains sort of end up in an odd place. You know, Harley Quinn is reformed. Poison Ivy may be too, and is in some versions, Harley's girlfriend. Both Talia al Ghul and Catwoman in the Batman comics are often less villain now and more, you know, Batman's love interest. Um, Black Cat in, in you know, Spider-Man comics is, is, you know, kind of a flip-flopper too. A lot of female villains are, are kind of kind of hard to, to pin down as being definite villains. And I just wanted to talk about a truly evil female villain, one that is absolutely, there's no redemptive qualities. It's not one of those, <laughs> it's not one of those, oh, but she's really hot at least. Like, I just want a really evil female villain and one that fans love to hate. And who better than Dolores Umbridge from the Harry Potter books and movies? You know, I'm a huge Stephen King fan. And funny story, Stephen King actually reviewed Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix for Entertainment Weekly uh, back in 2003. Um, And here's what he said about Umbridge. I'm going to quote here because it is a really memorable quote, I think. He says, A great fantasy novel can't exist without a great villain. And while you know who, Lord Voldemort, is a little too far out in the supernatural ozone to qualify, the new Defense Against the Dark Arts teacher at Hogwarts does just fine in this regard. The gently smiling Dolores Umbridge with her girlish voice, toad-like face, and clutching stubby fingers is the greatest make-believe villain to come along since Hannibal Lecter. One needn't be a child to remember the really scary teacher. The one who terrified us so badly that we dreaded the walk to school in the morning, and we turned the pages partly in fervent hopes that she will get her comeuppance, but also in growing fear of what she will get up to next. And King is right here. Uh, In a series full of seriously evil characters, Umbridge feels like by far the most hateable. God, that woman infuriated me when I read that book the first time. Her cruel punishments for, for the students, which really amount to physical abuse. The horrid pink outfits, her cheerful evil. Man, evil shouldn't be so darn cheerful. It's just, ugh, it runs all over me. It is it is one of the villains that I absolutely love to hate. And, and that's really sometimes what you need in a villain. A villain that is just absolutely, irredeemably, not unconflictedly evil. And I think Dolores Umbridge is a fantastic example of that, Chris. Yeah, absolutely. Now, full disclosure, um, I know that, um, at least for myself, Harry Potter has been a franchise that has been difficult for me to revisit based on uh, J.K. Rowling's stance on trans individuals and myself, uh, the parent of a trans child. It is particularly troubling to, to go back to that, but... I remember, I'll never forget how I felt reading Order of the Phoenix for the first time. And I was just like, she is worse than Voldemort. That, and that's saying something. Like the Dark Lord, the, the, a villain that is so awful, so irredeemable, that people refuse to say his name. And this one is widely regarded, this individual is widely regarded as far worse than Lord Voldemort. Um, and I also want to give props and, and I know a lot of, a lot of Harry Potter fans are like, the movies aren't that good or they're very much derided, but the portrayal by actress Imelda Staunton was pitch perfect to the point where it made me like start scratching myself and like, I, I, I thought I was going to go to a madhouse by how uncomfortable the character made me. So it was one of the few page to screen adaptations, uh, at least from that franchise that absolutely was nailed. But yeah, absolutely. Dolores Umbridge is like, it's, it's, it's one of the most universally abhorred individuals, as I said previously. And absolutely deservedly. So Chris (laughs) still gives me the shudders. I, I'll never forget the um, reading when he has to write, I will not tell lies. And it it's 
scraped onto his skin. Oh man, I'll never forget. I remember where I was sitting when I read that passage. Yeah, it's it's absolutely the worst, man. Ugh. All right, well, there you have it, folks. There are some of our favorite pop culture villains. After a quick break, we'll be back with some nerd commendations. Stick around. And we're back, folks, and it is the most uplifting, the most positive some dare say the best segment in our repertoire. It's time for Nerd That's right, Nerd Commendations. Chris, what are you nerd commending to our listeners this week? So one of my all-time favorite comic creators would be that of Dave Cockrum, the co-creator of iconic characters, uh, like Storm, Sunfire, Colossus, uh, or in this week's case, Nightcrawler. And so um, it can be sometimes troubling, as I've chronicled on the show before, to revisit old comics. Um, sometimes it's problematic, the language that's used, particularly with um, you know characters of color or, or what have you. But this this is not one of those cases. I am talking about... The original Nightcrawler miniseries, just four issues from 1985 to 1986, that was written and penciled by Dave Cockrum. I love comic series like this where you have one creative voice, you know, in collaboration with the anchors and the colorers and letters and what have you. But one person that this is really essentially, for all intents and purposes, their brainchild. So this is the co-creator of Kurt Wagner telling the story that he wants to tell. Um, and it's just, it, 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 it's very much of its time and, and, you know, everybody knows how crazy the eighties were, but it is very much just leaning into everything that is great about the character of Kurt Wagner of Nightcrawler. Um, it's a swashbuckling adventure. I mean, he's literally a pirate, uh, but you know, just a brief synopsis of the series, Kurt is training in the danger room, the training area of the X-Men, Kitty Pride and uh, Ilyana Rasputin, better known as Magic with a K, are goofing around with the controls. And poor Kurt is transported into an alternate dimension filled with tiny little doppelgangers of himself called Bamps, um, space pirates, uh, a beautiful princess... Uh, it, it is just a wild indulgence of everything that is great about the character. It's only four issues and it just leans into the absolute weirdness, um, sci-fi adventure that comics can be at its best. Um, it's, it's echoes of Star Trek, the original series, uh, it echoes the one of the prime inspirations for the character of Nightcrawler of Errol Flynn's Robin Hood. Uh, it's very much one of those like just romance cover type like adventure stories. Like it's super fun. It, like I said, it just completely leans into the character. It's weird. It's fun. It's nerdy. It's beautifully drawn. Uh, it, it is one of the most fun reading experiences and like it feels like I was transported to 1985. I mean, Ilyana's wearing a Michael Jackson thriller-esque t-shirt. Uh, the, the girls have the big permed out hair. Uh, it, it was really like going in a time capsule and like I was traveling through different dimensions myself. So Nightcrawler series, you can find it on Marvel Unlimited, just four issues. It's a quick read and it's just super, super fun. You know, this actually sounds much more uh, like something for me than the mainline X-Men books. I really like these offshot series that that focus on one individual character. And Nightcrawler is uh, just a really good character, period. Um, he's sort of been my gateway into the Krakoa era. His, his current series, Way of X, is actually, I think, um, the most accessible and most fun uh, that I've had, at least, trying to pick up an X-Men book in the current era. So I'm really here for this, Chris. It, it sounds really interesting. Yeah, also think of, I just this just dawned on me, think of like the Prince of Bride, but like in outer space. 
So this is this is very much in line with that. Oh, I'm here for it. All right, Dave. So you are going to the other side of the star-based fandom for another unauthorized oral history. Yeah, so a few weeks back, I recommended Secrets of the Force, an oral history of the Star Wars franchise that was written by Mark Altman and Edward Gross. And I did mention at the time that the two authors had used the oral history format previously, particularly in a two-volume history of Star Trek, pretty much the entire franchise. Well, this week, I'm here to say that the first volume in the Star Trek oral history is an absolute winner as well. I would say it's actually even better than the Star Wars one. I'm a pretty big fan of Star Trek, particularly the the original series and Deep Space Nine. They're probably my favorite shows. And the first volume focuses heavily on the creation of Star Trek as a concept, Gene Roddenberry's original vision, and the production of the original series, the animated series, and the first crew's movie outings. And it's absolutely fascinating. What I love most about this format applied to Star Trek is that, you know, many of the main players have written pretty extensively about their own experiences as a part of that franchise. But here you really get all of these different perspectives, plus the perspective of those who worked behind the scenes. A much clearer picture starts emerging from this sort of oral history format. And I feel really um, enlightened, I think, uh, about you know the early goings of Star Trek, and I'm very much looking forward to picking up the second volume and checking out what it's got to offer. So in short, this is definitely a big nerd commendation. If you at all enjoy Star Trek, uh, then you know the 50 year mission, the complete unces- uncensored, unauthorized oral history of Star Trek, the first 25 years is definitely worth the price of admission, Chris. Yeah, in spirit of the Olympics, it it is. Very easy to see that Marvel Comics is my number one fandom, but very rapidly within the last few years, the silver medalist has become Star Trek. I love everything about it. It is deep, it's expansive, it's progressive, it's new frontiers, um, strange new worlds. It really just captures my imagination uh, consistently. And, And I would totally agree with you. Deep Space Nine, I'm... I am gloriously journeying through that series for the first time. And it is already halfway through the fourth season, my favorite Star Trek series as well. But um, I also love the original series, even in its campiness. I love how I love what it meant for so many different populaces, what it meant for you know, civil rights, what it meant for pop culture, what it meant for nerds and how it birthed conventions and all of these things and, and getting an inside look at that, that is kind of a collective thing rather than, oh, here's what George Takei thought. Here was what Bill Shatner thought. Here's what Michelle Nichols thought. And, you know, even you said, as you said, people behind the scenes, uh, it's absolutely fascinating. And I'm definitely picking this one up. Yeah, it's it's totally worth the price of admission. Absolutely one of my favorite nonfiction books I've read in a long time, Chris. Well, there you have it, folks. A new episode of the Nerd by Word podcast is coming to an end. If you enjoyed what you just heard, please make sure you get on your favorite podcasting platform and give us a rating and or review. Um, we would love to make you a permanent listener to our podcast. We, of course, release new episodes every Monday and can be found on every podcasting platform you can imagine, including Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Uh, tune in radio we're of course also on amazon Um, we are pretty much everywhere including our very own website nerdbyword.com and if you like what you hear and you also want to give us some feedback on what we could do differently what you'd like to see in the future or thoughts on uh, the topics that we brought up today. What are your favorite villains? Who are your favorite villains throughout pop culture? Be sure to hit us up on uh, Instagram and Twitter at Nerd by Word or individually on Twitter and Instagram as well at That Nerd Dave and at That Nerd Chris, respectively. And as always, stay well and stay nerdy. The Nerd Byword is written and produced by Chris and Dave, two nerds with a love of all things pop culture. The podcast features music by Al Jimenez with additional drops composed by Joe Biondi. Our show art is by Ashery Design. Find us at nerdbyword.com and wherever podcasts are available. 